UGA School of Social Work. What that means in English is that I um, recruit for the MSW as well as the PhD program for the School of Social Work. I am glad to be here with you today. In addition to this job, I also was a student in the program. So I admit some of my views might be a little biased. Uh, I think it is one of the best programs in the state. And I absolutely am excited that you are here with us and want to have this discussion and figure out how you can move forward in this next step and next um, process for your uh, professional degree and professional career. I am turning on live transcription. I hope, and someone give me a wave if you can now see our, um, see our transcription at the bottom of the screen. I hope you can, yes, looks like, all righty. So we're going to talk today, and we've been having this series of information sessions that have been around different topics. It is a wonderful opportunity, and I take this opportunity so that people don't just hear my voice. I invite in guest panelists so that people can also hear about these different topics and have an opportunity to meet people from the School of Social Work and from UGA in general, who can help you and you can uh, as you matriculate through the program, as you are in the search for how to apply and funding and those types of things, I wanted to make sure that we had something we could do where you were not just hearing from me. And so with that, um, I have a, slat, a slate of panelists, guest panelists with us, who are going to um, talk to us today about application and the application process and funding. I want to allow them just a couple of moments before I jump into a very brief presentation. I want to allow them the opportunity to introduce themselves, tell just a little bit about um, what they do at the school, at, at UGA in general, and um, we'll get into some Q&A a little bit later on. Um, Tiffany Drayton is uh, with the graduate school we invited Tiffany today because the graduate school actually has separate funding from the School of Social Work, and we wanted to make sure you had that information. Tiffany, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us anything you want us to know about you. Hi, everyone. Um, like she said, I'm Tiffany Drayton. Title has changed to a budget specialist. It still works the same as accountant, <laughs> but I am here, like she said, from the graduate school just to talk to you about funding in general for graduate students. I, I know you they'll have some for you for social work, but I can give you a general overview of what's available from the graduate school as a whole, as well as as a student. You're not bound to actually have to get assistantships from social work. You can still be their student. They want you as your student, but you can work at different departments. So I will talk to you that as well. OK. Thank you. And thank you so much for spending this time with us this evening. I also wanted to introduce Dr. Allison Dunnigan, who is one of our directors for one of our funded training programs. Dr. Dunnigan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, uh, Yosha. Um, my name is Allison Dunnigan. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Social Work. I'm also the Title IV-E director, and the Title IV-E program is geared towards individuals who are um, committed, to committed to working in public child welfare. Um, and so I look forward to answering any questions you have about that or more broadly about the school, as I do teach in both the MSW and the PhD programs. Thank you, Dr. Dunnigan. And also Dr. Morrissey Saul, um, who is also a coordinator over one of our programs. Dr. Morrissey Saul, please introduce yourself. Hello, I am Kate Morrissey Stahl. I'm excited to be here with you this evening to talk about um, the DBHDD grant that I oversee, which is for folks who want to work in community mental health. So I'm a clinical assistant professor and I do uh, a lot of teaching clinical classes in the MSW program. And the DBHDD grant is the way to uh, get some funding for school so that you can work in community mental health. And then um, 
And then you pay that back by working for a year in a community mental health uh, organization. So I'm glad to talk more about that uh, and like Allison or the program more broadly. Thanks for having me here, Yusha. Again, thank you all for joining us. I wanna talk just a little bit about the University of Georgia. We are ranked 15th for best public national universities. I'm sure um, if you haven't seen yet um, or looked up yet, you will see that we are typically in the top 20. Um, we also are uh, 16th in the nation for best values in public colleges. In addition to that, specifically about our MSW program, we're consistently among the top universities for our MSW program. Currently, we're ranked 12th amongst public institutions. We are a competitive program. As you can imagine, with that 12th ranking, we're a competitive program. We usually, are, we usually admit somewhere between 200 and 250 students across all of our programs. Um, and when I say programs, all of our MSW program options in a year's time. And so I'll, I'll give you just a little bit more about that in a moment, but we are a competitive program. We also are fully accredited. All of our programs are fully accredited by the Council on Social Work Education. If you're not familiar with the Council of Social Work Education, uh, uh, the Council on Social Work Education, that is the governing body that says, this is what social work education should look like. And in order for you to, to graduate with that MSW, you have to be accredited by the CSWE. One other thing that we have here is that we also abide by the code of ethics. Whether you're in school or after you graduate, those are the governing principles that social workers um, abide by in the profession. And so we start off early, even in the application process, introducing you to the code of ethics, because that is, again, how we are principled as a profession. And so you have lots of opportunity to learn about, see, and discuss the code of ethics while you're in our program. Just wanted to give you a snapshot here of the research that is offered by the School of Social Work faculty. There is so much um, intersectionality in how these topics are addressed. We have a couple of uh, publications, the Social Justice Wanted Magazine, as well as um, the Research Review Magazine, where you can find out much more in depth how and what our faculty is researching. And um, I, would, I would put our faculty up against anyone and say to you, they are on the cutting edge of social work whether it be in education or in research. And so I, I offer to you, please get out there and look at the different people um, who are our faculty members, see what their research is, see who has the passion that you have and feel free to reach out to them. It, whenever you're coming back or thinking about coming back into a program, you have to remember that these are the people that you will be around for the next two to four years. And being able to have someone that has your research interests and you can dialogue with about those interests and take classes on it to learn is incredibly important. I'll give you just a little bit more about our program. We offer three different program options. The full-time program, we have an extended time program that is in person, and then we have an extended time program that is online. Just a little bit about each of these. I'll tell you the major differences. Our full-time program is the program that is at the Athens campus. It's only four semesters. There's an opportunity for an advanced standing. If you have a BSW within the last five years, and by BSW, I mean a bachelor's in social work. That is the only... Um, that is the only degree that would allow you to come into that advanced standing program. We, it's four semesters, the advanced standing cuts it to three semesters. Our extended time program in Gwinnett County is actually offered in the Metro Atlanta area. That is offered on our Gwinnett campus, which is about 35 to 40 minutes outside of Atlanta, just depending on which direction you go and how traffic is on that day, as many of you probably already are aware. 
if you're especially if you're considering that. This program can actually be three to four years, just depending on what track you choose. It is designed specifically for those who have to work during the day or may have other obligations during the day. That extended time program does have an advanced standing option associated with it as well. Classes are offered in the evening and night and the course loads are smaller so that you are able to, so that it extends the time, but you're able to complete your degree. Our online program is also an extended time program. It is offered um, with the three-year option only. That three, that three years is the classes are offered at night and um, are at night and it does not have an advanced standing option with it currently. I will say this, because we operate on a cohort model, it, it, we do not usually, and it is not encouraged that you try to move throughout the programs because a lot of times what you need is not offered at a specific time or during a specific semester. It is offered specifically for, for that cohort. And so moving throughout the programs is not really um, an option. Just a little bit about the specializations that are offered. In your first year, you will come through the program or in your first year, you will join the program as a generalist student. Your second year, after you complete all of those first, or after you complete all of those generalist courses, you move into a specialization. We offer three areas of specialization. They include the micro specialization, which is what we typically think about when we think about social work. It is a lot of case management. It is um, counseling therapy. It is um, some program management work or managing different uh, groups and those types of things. That is offered across all of our programs. It's offered in Athens, Gwinnett, and online. We also offer a macro practice concentration that is offered in Athens only. That macro concentration is a lot of policy development, it's program evaluation, it's administration. If you're thinking about doing nonprofit, um, nonprofit management, et cetera, all of those can fit under this macro practice, um, macro practice specialization. Additionally, we also have the combined practice specialization. And we take curriculum from both the micro and the macro and put stu or allow students to um, complete classes in both. That is not saying that you're not allowed to take classes in both for your electives, but this specifically um, centers a more meso-focused education line for those students who want to be able to do that. I think I see a question. Um, Rose, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I would. I didn't know whether you're doing questions before or after. Um, so I remember you said that you do the cohort model. Um, I'm interested in doing a dual degree program with the MPH. How would that work with the cohort model? Like, would I still be with the same people or would I just transition through like with other people like as I go and take MPH classes as well? Yeah, we'll talk about it in just a moment. I will say this, thank you for your question, is that that cohort model will, it will lengthen your time slightly, but not so much that you are, so your graduation date will get moved out, but it does it in, in such a way that it's only, I want to say, an additional year of schooling for you. And so you would end up or for those who are thinking about doing a dual degree, you would end up extending your time, but it's possible that you still will know students uh, and have an opportunity to build relationships with students, even though you're, you're in a different cohort than what you came in. Does that, I hope that helps. That did help. Um, and I have one more question. Okay. Um, are you guys doing tours for the, call, uh, for the School of Social Work? 
I'll go over that as we get ready to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. One of the other things in our field is our field education. This is one of our chief pedagogies. So the CSWE says that you learn by doing and doing means field education for social work. We consider it challenge by choice. One of the things that our field education department um, uh, is wants to be able to do and loves to be able to do is help round out your education. So while you may want to work with veterans once you're out of school, they may pick for your first year, for your generalist year, they may pick something that is closely aligned with working with veterans. They may choose um, a mental health facility. They may choose uh, working with groups, something that's closely aligned so that you can help round out your education. I will say this also, our field education does help you, um, does assign for you and help select for you the your field placement. They do that out of more than 500 organizations that we're partnered with across the state. Um, those are deep connect, deep UGA connections, right? That's a part and a benefit of being uh, coming to UGA are those deep connections. And so with that, I will also say this, field education is required. You cannot graduate without your MSW, with your MSW without doing this field placement. For those that are online, your field education has to be completed for right now because our program is so new within the borders of the state of Georgia. So just be mindful of that. Um, and when I tell, here's the other thing that I think is really neat about field education is that you start off week seven of your generalist year going right into field education. Uh, you, you're active that from week seven all the way through the end of the year. And then in your specialization year, you start week one going into your specialization. We don't leave you to fly that on your own. You are given a class at the very beginning um, of your, at the very beginning of the semester to help you, to help facilitate your field education. Certificate programs, I mentioned the nonprofit um, earlier. We have several certificate programs that you are able to participate in. This helps tailor, right, some of your education and some of the things that you want to be able to, um, some of the things that you want to be able to delve into it also makes you more competitive. Don't forget, an MSW is a professional degree. And so this makes you more competitive in the job market. We, the MFT certificate is one of our most popular. We are the only school right now in the state of Georgia that has a substance use certificate. Um, gerontology, some of these are done with other programs across, the, across campus. And then our management of nonprofit organizations is done in-house at our uh, nonprofit. We have a nonprofit uh, leadership uh, offering through the School of Social Work, and that is where uh, our nonprofit management, our management of nonprofit certificate is offered. These certificate programs do not lengthen your time in school. You, you, utilize, your, you utilize your electives to fulfill these requirements for certificates. I will say this for the marriage and family therapy, therapy, as well as the substance use, it gives you everything you need to be able to go and sit for your um, certificate exam after you, you've completed this. Another option is the is for how you tailor your education are our dual, dual degree programs. We have three dual degree offerings currently, the MSWJD, which is jurisprudence, the MSW Master in Divinity and the MSW MPH. And these are collaborations between these schools such that you are able to obtain two masters in less time than if you've done them separately and individually. What that means and what that looks like is that we take some of the classes from the School of Social Work and some of the classes for this, um, the other school and utilize them as dual or utilize them for dual credits across both schools. So that's how you're able to complete it 
more quickly. One caveat to this is that you do have to be accepted into both schools. So um, those who are interested, for instance, in the MSW MDiv, you have to be accepted into the Emory Candler School of Theology as well as the UGA School of Social Work. I do see that there are questions popping up in the chat. Thank you for those that are answering. Appreciate that. Now, today's session specifically is about application and the application process and funding. So I want to reintroduce to you, I call it reintroducing, but I want to invite our panelists into this conversation. I um, would love for them to tell us just a little bit more about the funding options that are available. Um, what is the funded training program? How does that work? Tell us a little bit more about what you have to offer as it relates to funding for those who are planning or hope to join the School of Social Work. I would like to invite um, Ms. Drayden, if you will, please. Hello again. So I am here just to talk about graduate school assistantships and funding as a whole. So um, like Professor Dotson said earlier, the graduate school does have assistantships available for students directly from us. It is not through your department, which will be social work. We have four actually, I'm, well, four major ones. So we have the Presidential Graduate Fellowship Award, we have the Graduate School Doctoral Fellowship Award. We have the Graduate School Master's Fellowship Award. We have the Dissertation Completion Award. So those are our biggest four within the graduate school. Those essentially are a top off award. So if you are awarded this, say you get the Presidential Fellowship Award from us, you would be on an assistantship for social work but we would additionally give you a $10,000 on top of that assistance So, and that is for five years. Do not quote me on that, but it's multiple years. Let's, look, let's take a year off, multiple years, you will get this social work assistance plus $10,000. So that, those how our awards work, those four. Presidential fellow is the 10, doctoral is seven, master's is 5,000, and the dissertation, that's the only one that is the actual assistantship. So instead of that top off award, this one will be, you'll actually get a stipend from the graduate school. You, it will still flow through social work, but the money is coming from the graduate school. As far as our application process for funding, if you don't hear anything else from me, this entire panel or any questions, get to know Professor Dotson or anyone who is on our coordinators listservs. So we send our notifications or it's time to apply for these awards, probably starting now. I believe our press fellow one came out and our application deadline usually January and February. So it will be starting now, you should be contacting the mass, the social work department of like, hey, have you gotten that email about the graduate school funding? How can I apply and what are my qualifications? That's how we work on our side. Now, <laughs> I, and if you hear, if for me, I say apply, apply for anything. Yes, we are pro social work. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> but in addition to social work assistantships, you can work somewhere else as well. So funding is open to you to work even for, for me. I have a graduate assistant who is from ecology. She does graduate assistant work in my office, just like an assistant. So you, um, the beauty of assistantships now, which I am a pro for, is you apply for it like you're applying for a job. So you go to UGA jobs, job search website. There's an icon for graduate student temp working. Click on that one and all departments have to list what they need in their department. Do they need a graduate assistant? A graduate assistant is someone who works in an office. 
You can be filing papers for a department. They could be looking for a teaching or a lab assistant. That is usually TAs. You will be teaching a class, usually undergrad, I believe. Social work can help me on that, how they do their um, teachers or lab assistants. And then they have graduate research assistants. Those are students who will work specifically with probably a professor or a PI in their lab or with their research. I say apply, apply, apply for everything. <laughs> like that is, that's if all you hear is apply for everything we have. We do have smaller, what's called um, tuition waivers. So I know she has on here, it's called the Regents Out of State Tuition Waiver. That is for students who um, are out of state who want to get that, to, that out of state costs waived and you'll be considered an in-state student. That's, that, that's a great one. But especially if you don't get the Georgia, you're not from Georgia. We also have the, I'm trying to think of another one we have. We have specific um, funding for your research. Those are usually done in the spring. So when you become this master of social work student and you have a research project you're doing in the summer, we have awards to help you fund your research. Those are, um, I think they're called SICOM awards, but again, go contact Professor Dotson. <laughs> She'll have that list of information of anything, all funding that we offer. So what do you get? That'd be the biggest question of like, what comes with my assistantship? What are the perks outside of my stipend? You get reduced tuition. So for an assistantship, your tuition is reduced to $25 plus your fees. Woohoo! If only I knew that when I was in school. <laughs> so I, yes, look, I saw somebody clap their hand. That'd be something I would do. Um, yes, yeah, so your tuition is dropped to $25 plus your fees. So students usually pay per semester about $1,400. I think that's about, that's if you have all the fees of the university. Requirements as an assistantship. I don't know if you want, you want me to talk about requirements. Just I'll do general yeah. ones. Now, they can vary from department to department. Once you have, you're in your department and you have your job, they will have requirements for you. But the ones I will be looking at to make sure you have a job that is at least 13 hours to 20 hours a week, and you have to be a full-time student. Now, full-time student for students on assistantships are 12 graduate credit hours in fall and spring and nine graduate credit hours in the summer. The summer is only if you actually are going to be working. So that, that's up to how much you're assistantship is giving you. If you're doing, working from fall and spring and summer, you'll have to be registered for summer. For the, the 13 hours a week, you do have to work for the entire semester. So that is from the first day of classes to the last day of classes. That's how long your working period is. But as far as I, I would do it <laughs> if I was a student, <laughs> I, I would go for it. Scholarships are done through the scholarship universe system and um, you would log, type in it i actually i will have to look it up and i'll put in the chat the actual link to um the scholarship universe you would just re you i think they do a um like profile you will say what you're studying what um program you're in if you're a master's or doctor student and then they'll they'll give you lists of what you can apply for and then loans are done through the financial aid office. I believe graduate students are only afforded loans. It's no um, like Pell grants or anything for graduate students. I believe you only have access to loans, but that'll be something you will find on the financial um, aid website. Um, that's really all I have. It'll be my presentation will be more of the questions you asked me. So I'll let um, the other panelists speak for a little bit and then I'll just answer all your questions you have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very rich information. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Morrissey Stahl, you're next on my screen. Uh, will you please join us in talking a bit about, see if I can get it up here, some of the School of Social Work funding. 
Yes, and I'll talk about DBHDD in particular. So this is in your specialization year that you can apply for DBHDD funding and it's $10,000 during that year. And, um, and then your field placement is in community mental health somewhere. That's what a community service board is. So a hospital or a community mental health clinic. Um, and then your agreement is that you will work for a year in community mental health when you graduate at least a year um, to sort of pay back the money. So this is a way that students who want to work in community mental health, which is where my career started, uh, can get some funding for that. And also we do some extra training for people who are in the program. So it ends up being, I think, a good deal for people. And then I also have graduate assistants who work with me, but again, that's through uh, at the departmental level. I'll pass the ball back to you, Yosh. I was thinking of whether to pass the ball to Allison or to you, but all right. Pass it to Allison, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so the Title IV program, I know it mentions on here the National Child Welfare Workforce Institute. You can just like mentally put an X through that because that's a grant funded program and it's ending um, next year. So we had to have people already enrolled. So, um, but we do have the Title IV program and we are, um, it is offered at both the Gwinnett campus and the Athens campus right now. And we are very hopeful and intend to expand it to the online only program as early as next year. But um, we are, uh, the Title IV program is for individuals who are willing and interested, not willing, interested in working in public child welfare upon graduation. And so the students in the Title IV program have to take um, two, two of their electives have to be child welfare related and their, their field placements are both in DFACS. And so that's the Division of Family and Children's Services here for those of you who are out of state. And so both of your internships will be there. You will get exposed to different counties, different offices, different um, program areas within DFACS, but th both of your internships will be there. And upon graduation, you then start your clock. And for every academic year you receive funding, you uh, are required to be employed for um, one calendar year. So it's like a spring and a fall of, or fall and a spring year, you got funding that whole, a whole calendar year. So that's 180 for 365, right? So you have to do 365 days of employment. Um, and that's for every year of funding. The funding is a full tuition coverage in state tuition. And so if you are interested in any of these, like, I think regardless of what you're interested in, apply for that out of state waiver in any cases, the worst thing that they're going to say is no, and that puts you right back where you are at now. So it's fine. Um, so we cover full tuition and fees um, for the fall and spring semesters, and we also provide a modest stipend. That stipend has been $750 a semester for um, full-time students and $500 a semester for um for uh, part-time students. And you can, the application process, it's on the website you, um, under financial aid. You can just go straight in and apply. Um, we ask that you wait until you have your admission decision before you apply. Um, and then we do our interviews in May. Thank you. I see a question here that asks specifically, and, and I am opening it up for questions. There are lots of questions in chat. There are lots of um, lots of questions back and forth. I, I did see a question here that says, um, does DBHDD apply to Athens? Go, um, did you want to talk more about that, Dr. Morris's song? Sure, yep, it's both Athens and uh, Gwinnett, and yeah, so that's in there, it is both. And Title IV, -E, I'm typing this too, wouldn't overlap with DBHTD because your placement would be different. So DBHTD would be in community mental health, your field placement, and uh, Title IV -E would be at DFACS. Okay, 
So in Title IV, it's, it's kind of like double dipping. I'm a, I'm a fan of a hustle. And yes, I think we should all get as much funding as we can, but you can't do Title IV in an assistantship or Title IV in DBHDD or Title IV in our HRSA grant that we have. You can't double dip because it's federal money and the, the feds don't like that. So, and that's true for all of us. So we would have those conversations with you when you are um, when you are applying, just so that you know that you're going to this eyes wide open and you're making the choice that's the best for you. But I would also say this: that remember, with those funded training programs, your tuition gets covered, and so technically there wouldn't be a need for double or triple dipping because your tuition gets paid. Go, yeah. go ahead, Dr. Donegan. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, but sometimes people are like, hey, I'll take whatever, you know, thinking that they can do multiple. You can't, you can't build them up on top of each other. Yeah. Yeah. I see the question here about a Title IV student who wants to reapply. You just fill out the same application. Um, that uh, you completed previously, I I'm assuming for a different institution, if it was, um, but you just fill out that application online and it gets sent to us. You're, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. And I'm gonna put my um, email in the chat, but I know it's probably on the slides too. I noticed also this international student eligibility. And I wanted to say that DBHDD is state money and uh, Title IV is federal money. I don't know if they're different. I think that DBHDD is open to international students. Title IV is open to international students who are eligible to be employed by DFATS. So as long as your visa and your, or the works like your, that you have those, um, you have that information, you have that um, approval to be able to be employed by DFACS, you can apply for Title IV. And so we've had international students participate, but there have been cases where we haven't been able to accept someone um, due to their status. And I wanted to jump in about international students on assistantships. Yes, you are eligible for that as well. We don't fall into the, the working category because you'll still be considered like student, but, um, Yes, international students can apply for any assistantship. I've had three international students as, as um, graduate assistants, so absolutely. My uh, GA is international student, so yes. <laughs> um, so I anticipate that we will be expanding Title IV to the online only program. Um, I, I believe it will be within the next year for this incoming cohort, particularly if they are currently DFACS employees, that's a priority for our partnership with DFACS. But if you are not going, if you are not currently employed by DFACS and are going, are interested in the online only program, reach out to me and I will talk with you about that. Um, and then um, there was another question about DFAC, how many hours with DFACS that if I don't know if you're talking about for your internship or if it's for um, your employment, your employment, it's it's the two years um, or one year for every year you receive funding. So two or three years, depending upon the program that you're in. And if it's about the internship, all of our field education um, is the same. You do two years in your general, two days in your generalist year. <laughs> Yeah, two days in your generalist year. So that's right at 16 hours. And then you have 20 or 21 hours in your specialization year each, each week. I see a question here too that asks specifically about when you apply, how do you apply on your application? You have to special, specify which program you're interested in. If you still have some outstanding questions, then please let's have some additional conversations so that we can make sure that as you're applying, it's the program that you um, would want to uh, be a part of, whether that be the in-person online or the extended time in person. Uh, is there a better chance of receiving an assistantship if we apply before January 1? I, I think we were about to read the same question. Um, as far as our uh, application deadlines, not necessarily. As long as you meet in that deadline, we look, we view all at the same time. But as far as if you're going 
on the UGA job search, I would say I would like to be the first one on the application roll to be looking down. So I say February and January is the time that departments are filling their assistantships in. That's because the students are accepting into different programs. So that's why we usually if February, January is that time, but not necessarily. I say if when you see the availability, that's when you apply for it. It doesn't have to be before January, but no. Thank you. What has been the trans uh, transition for out of state students in the advanced standing program. Did either of our Dr. Morrissey Stahl or Dr. Dunnigan, did you want to address any of that? I'm trying to find the question again. Um, we, would you say it again? Mm -hmm. What has been the transition for out of state students in the advanced standing program? The transition, like in terms of finding a job? or the transition uh, for out-of-state students to come in and work through the program? Yeah, just, uh. yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Keisha Line. I'm currently in a BSW program in Connecticut. And I previously lived in Georgia, I loved it. Um, and it's kind of scary to like kind of go back and uproot my family, but I've loved the program since the beginning, what I've read. The fact that you guys have your syllabus online and I see like even some of the books that you guys are using currently, we're using up here. But I wanted to know like, what has been your experience when you get out of state students with the BSW program? Because I was just thinking like the teaching might be different or I don't know, the quality of the work. I have loved having out of state students and I'm thinking about advanced standing specifically and, and how quickly it goes. And maybe there would be additional thoughts that others uh, have. But my general experience is that people have, um, you know, enjoyed being uh, in Athens. And it would be the only thing with advanced standing is the quick move, right? Because you'd move, then it'd be the summer, the year. And so the program would go uh, really quickly. And the whole time you could keep in mind where you wanna be licensed, whether it's in Georgia or whether it's in Connecticut or somewhere else. And when you keep an eye to that, you know what to make sure to have so that you can be licensed in whatever state you wanna work in. Yeah, I just, I think that the international or the, the out of state students that have come, I think in particular this summer, I haven't taught in the advanced standing bridge semester over the summer, but it's my understanding that the students who participate in that get really connected because there's not as many courses that are offered. And so you sort of get to know each other really well and you're all excited and new. So it's been, it's my understanding that the students who participate in the advanced standing program really um, like take advantage of the fact that there's not as many people on campus. It's a smaller group and they sort of get connected. Um, so that's, that's something that I've noted. Thank you, ladies. Um, I see a question here as well. Can I apply for advanced standing as an international student? I have a degree in social work and a year of coursework in M field social work. If your, if your degree is from an accredited university, a CSWE accredited university, then yes, you can apply for advanced standing. And there's a list on the CSWE's website. There's also the question, how does the School of Social Work help students to get connected to the community? And I will say, uh, or connect students to campus. So there's, uh, I actually read it as community. I was like, oh, you're in the community right away. Okay, great. Um, in terms of other parts of the campus, some of the certificate programs are on other parts of the campus. So if you're doing the MPH, MSW, as you talked about, that would be one way that you'd be linked to different parts of campus. The MPH program also is connected with the Institute of Gerontology. There's lots of interesting things that can happen there. Um, so the dual degree programs do it, but it, it also is true in certificates like marriage and family therapy. People are linked to human development and family science, uh, that school. So many times students are moving between the different schools at, at UGA. Um, I did want to ask that question, but thank you for the answer. Um, Social wise, like, are there events or different connections that the school social work has with uh, organizations and stuff on campus that would help uh, the students get like socially acclimated to the campus? 
there's a couple of student led organizations that are definitely um, really focused on the student experience. So I'm thinking of our SFC and then the new Bridging the Gap and group. And there's a couple. So there's a number of student groups that do activities, and we certainly encourage that. I think um, there's a lot of opportunities, some that are untapped, that they're underutilized within the university as a whole that are open to our students as graduate students who are you are students and on this campus and you have all of those opportunities. So we, we find that a lot of our students maybe focus more of their efforts just within the School of Social Work, but there are, there are a lot of opportunities, um, particularly for those who may um, have that interest or that initiative to go and seek them out. Awesome. And I have one last iteration of the question. Um, so how I guess, are there different identity based groups within the school of social work that would help like bring out the different connections and stuff among students, like just within the school of social work? I would say that those opportunities are based on student interest and student participation. As a faculty, we tend to allow the students to come up with those things that they want to be able to do and then we support them. So if there's something that you would specifically like to see or want to see, then we would encourage you to jump in and um, participate in that way. Yeah, there's nothing preventing you from being a student leader on some of those things, right? And creating those opportunities that you think if you see something's missing, the Bridging the Gap group, they create that's a new group that got created in the last year. A student saw a need and they have been very active and have done that. And we, the faculty, have supported that. So um, there's always those opportunities. I think I see two oh, hands. Oh, oh, my apologies. Oh, I just said thank you. Oh, my apologies, Rose. I think I see two hands, Keishla and then Kylie. So for um, the programs that you have that are dual degree, I know you said that you have to apply to both colleges. Um, when it comes to financial aid, um, will the Athens campus, for example, help facilitate, facilitate that? Or do you have to apply for financial aid for both of the programs or awards for both of the programs? And then you take the courses only in one of the colleges? I am not sure how that works. <laughs> I can certainly ask and get an answer, but I am unsure of how that works. Does anyone else know how that works? No, okay. Let me jot that down um, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Can I also be CC'd in the answer? Yosha, did you catch that, that Rose would also like to be included and in, in, in notified of the answer of that? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Kylie and then Alan and is it Saeed Datu? Go ahead, Kylie. Hi, thanks. Um, I've just been working on my application um, to the School of Social Work, and I think I asked about this in one of the last um, sessions, but it's still only showing the 2021-2022 school year or the summer 2022 um, semester that you can apply for, um, and I just didn't know if that's just like a glitch or if the 2022 application hasn't been officially put up or what that's about? It should have gone live in August. So let me look into that as well. Because I just wanted to make sure that the application wasn't going to change after I'd started on the personal statement section is really my biggest um, concern. And we did make a change and so I'm not, there should, what you are looking at should include six questions. I yes. Six questions, it talks specifically about the code of ethics. Yes, yes it does, okay. Good. Okay, okay, then that is the correct application. Perfect, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Alan, I think. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you're unsure 
um, whether the extended time or full time program would work better for you. Do you need to apply to both of them separately or do you apply to the School of Social Work as a whole and, and then that's a decision you can make um, after being admitted? Yeah, the, the application should ask you which program you want to be a part of. If you, are, if you are still considering both, I would say let's have a few more conversations to help you tease out what it is that you need and we can help um, direct you in some of that decision making or help giving you more information so that you can make that decision. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it Sayi Datu? Go ahead. I can't hear you if you're talking. I still can't hear you. Can you can check you your, now? I think I heard you just then. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, so. I'm from Ghana and I was checking on the advanced standing. And from what I know from CSWE is that some of the schools, they tell you to send your documents over to them for um, processing to see whether you would be a fit for the advanced standing or not. So I don't know, do I do the same thing with UGA or I just apply directly and the school does that for me? If you want to look at it, want us to look at it preliminarily, we can. If you want to go ahead and send those to me, I'm going to drop my email in the chat box. And so I've not done it. I've not done it yet. So I'm just inquiring whether I should do it or the school will do it for me directly. Oh, no, you have to you have to select that you want to do advanced standing whenever you complete your application. I know that. I know that. What I'm saying is that, do I have to process my documents with CSWE before I apply, or I can just go ahead and pick the advanced standard and then UGA will do that for me? Because my degrees are coming from Ghana. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So you're asking if we need if you have to submit your your documents to CSWE to make sure that you comply, or does the does the School of Social Work make that evaluation and assessment of if it yes, qualifies? Please. Yes, please. That's what I'm asking. So the, as long if your school is CSWE accredited, then you can submit your documents. If you're unsure, then you can send them to us and we can help you tease out that information. But you, you would submit all of your documentation to UGA rather than CSWE. Okay, so my doc, so if I'm getting it right now, I submit my documents to UGA and not CSWE. Correct. So I can go on, so I can go on ahead and pick the advanced standard then. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is it Lael? Yes, I just had a question about just filling up the application as a whole. So when I started my application, I didn't necessarily see an option um, for the event standing. The only option I saw I think it said like A Y S and then it just said like 22 through 23. So I'm assuming that's fall and spring, but I'm getting my BSW, I graduate in May. So with that being said, even though I'm filling out the application, um, will I automatically be admitted to the event standing despite the um, choice that I picked on the application? It's supposed to, you're, you're supposed to select it. 
And so can you reach out to me? I've dropped my email in the chat to, so that we can make sure you're in the right place. I'm gonna connect you with um, Miss Emma is, can help you correct that on the back side. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. She's one of our staffers that works specifically with the application. Okay. There's not a specific format for following whenever you do your resume, however you want your resume to look. My suggestion would be to make sure that you put it in a PDF as you submit it or whenever you get ready to submit it. And the question about um, what we're looking for in the application process and who reviews them, um, the, the faculty is, is who reviews the applications. And for the narrative statements, what we're interested in, um, we're interested in critical thinking and judgment, insight, um, and, and, and authenticity, right? Uh, you know, a sincere desire to be involved in social work, like that's, that's a good thing. Um, so those are sort of some of the things, uh, Dr. Morrissey Stahl or Yosha, I don't know if there's other things that you would say that you also look for when you're reviewing applications. Go ahead, Dr. Morrissey Stahl. I was reading a question at the same time, so this could be a repeat. I'm going through the questions, and it would be uh, the service experience too. Uh, makes it yeah. nice hearing what people have been up to, how they've illustrated they already have some experience uh, working in this field. Many times is useful to see. I see here. Um, I live in Duluth and work in Duluth. Was considering. You desire to choose one program and not alternate between the two. It is not because of how the programs are set up on the cohort model. It is not, I don't want to say not possible, but it's not feasible. <laughs> feasible. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it is possible because you can't register for classes across. Like, I don't think you can switch. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was trying to use my, um, you know, how you do your positive, your, spin it positive. They're, you're you're base, unable yeah. to do that because we're in a cohort model and certain classes are only offered at certain times. So they don't allow you to, to do it back and forth that way. Um, Rose, you had a question. Yes, this is going back to the resume real quick. So uh, I was trying to decide whether for, I guess, programs and uh, organizations that you guys might not be familiar with when, um, when listing them into my resume, is it best to just give a description of them or should I just like do my, um, cause there are some that I was just listing because like my involvement in them wasn't like uh, in a leadership position. Um, so is it fine to do that or should I give a description for anything that I mentioned or just leave it off if I can? I know from the application, let me say it this way. I know from the application that in addition to whatever documents you submit, there are also places for you to be able to describe some things and elaborate on some things. Mm -hmm. However, you feel like you're able to put your best foot forward for your resume, for your questionnaire, the questionnaire and the personal narrative are the same. I see the, that question there. The questionnaire and the narrative are the same um, from my perspective. However, you need to put that best foot forward. Um, include what it, what you feel like you need to. Uh, there, a lot of times, there are questions about GPA, and and people want to be able to explain, you know, why their GPA might not be at a certain point, and those types of things. Explain whatever it is that you feel like you need to, and and you would like to, as it relates to how how you present yourself on your application. Does that? I hope that helps. I think it does, and um, I had another question, but it just I just blinked on it. Okay, we'll come back to it. Um, Alan and Jackie. Hey, uh, when it comes to the letters of recommendation, uh, I'm I'm coming to this later in life uh, and changing careers. Um, so you know, any any letters of recommendation from my undergrad experience would have been you know from a long time ago. But should I still seek out uh, professors that I had in undergraduate, or people that I worked for in my previous career, or people who worked for me, or um, people who, who I know who were who 
work in the field? Um, is there any kind of guidelines for that? Um, we don't have specific guidelines. Uh, Dr. Morrissey Stahl, Dr. Donegan, feel free to weigh in here. We don't have specific guidelines. One of the things that we understand is that there are non-traditional students who will come back and we ask that you find good, strong letters of recommendation, people who can um, speak to your, your character, people who can speak to your work ethic, people who can speak to um, those things that you think are important characteristics for why you want to be in the field of social work. Dr. Morrissey Stahl, Dr. Dunnigan, please jump in. Yeah, I think it's very clear and you can just reference it in your personal narrative about how this is a career shift. Um, and having professional references as opposed to academic ones is, is, is completely understandable and appropriate. Um, specifically those that speak to or can speak to why social work, you're a good fit for social work, why that, you know, what some things that you have done or how this is, you know, how this transition came about, I think that's that's completely appropriate and would be compelling as a as a letter of recommendation. I'm gonna pause right here for just a moment because I do want to be respectful of time and I have already taken five minutes from those who may not have been able to stay on any longer than the six o'clock hour. I am going to stay here and continue to answer questions. If any of our panelists would like to do so, then please stay as well. I would like to thank our panelists very much for joining us today. <clears throat> on your screen, you should see contact information for a few key people in the School of Social Work, including um, Paul Middlehammer and Candace Wooden-Smith, who are my counterparts in Gwinnett and, and the online program. Miss Emma Maddox, if you're having trouble with the application, this is Miss Emma's information for you to reach out to her as well, or you can send that information to me. Do not call my phone. Do not leave me messages. I am hardly ever there. It is so much easier to reach me by email. Please, please, if you need to get in contact with me, do it that way. I'm going to say thank you to all of those who have to drop off. We appreciate you. We're go going to get through this process together. Send me an email. Um, reach out if you need anything. If you have to drop off, I'm gonna give just about 10 seconds for that. And then I'm gonna keep answering questions. Um, and so again, I'm giving about 10 seconds for those who can stay on. If you're unable to um, stay on, I am also, we're recording this and we will have it posted online. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Feel free to drop off if you need to. Thank you, Miss Drayton. We appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I dropped my email as well as the general um, GS Finance email for the business office for graduate school. So you can just email us your questions and we'll answer them. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I am going to answer a few more questions for those that are hanging in there. I'm also gonna stop sharing so that I can see faces. I hope you all don't mind that. Um, what other questions? I wanna make sure that I didn't miss anything. Am I eligible for the PhD program? A PhD in social work? Oh, Dr. Dunnigan, I see that you're still here, hey. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and I and I responded to Lolita just to let her know to reach out to Dr. Washington because she okay. does have a master's degree, so it's a possibility that she might um, qualify. Oh, good, great, great. Yes, so please do. Um, let's see, very helpful, lots of thanks. You're welcome, you're welcome. The course syllabi are used generally any syllabus that you find online is not going to be necessarily the most, uh, the actual syllabus for a class. Those you usually get from your professors um, as you are going through the program. 
uh, Dr. Dunnigan, I saw your, your smirk there. Anything you would like to add? That faculty <laughs> will create their syllabi pro and change them, modify them probably up to the day before you see them in class. So um, just know that we, we, we tinker with them a lot up until <laughs> the final moment. Um, but in some of the, and also there's a lot of um, academic uh, freedom. And so faculty may teach the class a little bit differently. So if you have a section of um, our of, uh, human behavior and you get it from one person and then from another, the syllabi might look a little bit different. There may be some commonalities across because we want to have some integrity in our program, but that there may be some differences. So there, it's not as, it's not, um, it's not always going to be um, exactly the same experience. So you could see a syllabus online and then come to class and be like, well, this is really different. And, and that's just part of it. Right. Uh, and I want to make sure I'm able to answer questions. I think, Jackie, you've had your hand raised for a while. I want to get to that. And then... Um, Say that too. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Please correct me. Um, and then Kylan. Go ahead, Jackie. Oh, okay. All right. Um, my only question, well, actually I had two. Um, one of my questions was really, I'm a transfer student. So when I transferred to Georgia State, yes, I transferred to Georgia, um, Georgia State pretty much. Would I have to submit that? Um, when I submit that um, unofficial, which it kind of like, what? Well, not even that. When I apply, it kind of like, um, how do I say, like constructed my GPA a little bit. So it's two GPAs that's actually on my um, transcript. So which GPA do I go by? The both of them is really good, but I just want to know. <laughs> Typically they will use the uh, cumulative GPA. Okay. Um, and you would submit both of your transcripts. Okay, then this is my second question. I'll leave you guys alone. Um, so pretty much it was more so about the program, um, the DBHDD, but I'm currently a 4E student and that program really does sound really interested to me, like really interesting. So I wanted to look into that one as well. So how would that really work? This is um, more so towards you because um, yeah. as a, yeah, I do have that commitment and- So if you are not enrolled in a Title IV program as an MSW student, then your deferment does not get approved. You only get to defer if you're Title IV. So you either are Title IV or you start work in July for DFACS. So you'll see my application. It's okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> I, I will forget that you asked that question. Uh, but just so you know that that is, um, that, that's, we've run into that um, from time to time. So. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Say, hi. Oh, go ahead, Kylie. Oh, is it me? Sorry. Yep, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, I was just wanting to um, make certain that the assistantships, if you want to be like a research assistant, do I reach out to the professor or I go on the UGA jobs website? Go ahead, yes. Dr. Dunnigan. Yeah, the assistantship. Um, so there's different ways that you can be an assistant. You can get an assistantship that gives you funding. And that I, I think that's probably what you're interested in. And those applications, you can indicate that you're interested in that during the admission process. And those applications will come out in the spring. The other thing, and, and you get matched with a faculty member. And so you know, I have some of my students doing research and then some of my students who aren't interested in research that are graduate assistants are doing other um, other things for me. Sometimes they don't realize that they're still doing research for me. Um, and then I also have um, volunteer as, um, stu students who are not who are not getting a graduate assistantship, but are interested in the work that I'm doing and they do research with me as well. And so it depends, Kylie, because if you get if you get an assistantship and you get matched with someone and they have lots of things for you to do, but it's not exactly up your alley, you may reach out, you can on your own reach out to faculty 
and do something above and beyond what you are already required to do as your assistantship. And so I've, I've had that situation where students have done that. And I've also had students who in, as part of their assistantship, they were doing research with me. And there are lots of professors who offer those uh, same opportunities. I yeah, would also- I'm not unique. <laughs> I would also suggest that if you're going to apply for an assistantship to go out to that faculty page so that you can talk and speak to in your in your um, assistantship application so that you can speak to and talk to what it is that the um, what it is that those professors are actually looking to or what, what it is they're actually doing and so also in, in anything that you write about write about what and how you want to utilize your interest in the profession. Uh, don't forget this is a professional degree. So write about that as well. Go ahead, uh, Sayidatu. Okay, so hi, I'm inquiring about the referees. So one of my referees has, he currently has problems with his work email. So I'd want to know whether he can use his private email to write my reference or he has to use the work email. It's a hard no for the work email. He can utilize his private email. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I see here, Rose says, is admissions based on meeting the requirements or does the talent of the pool impact admissions? Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that, please? Yeah, um, so I was just wondering, like, uh, I know we have the requirements of like what you need to uh, like get into the school of social work and like, uh, I guess like whether you're a good enough candidate, um, is that based on like you just simply meeting the requirements of the GPA, the transcript, uh, the resume and all that stuff, or is it based on like, are you in competition with the people that you um, are applying with? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it does. We are a competitive program. Like I said, we, we do have numbers that we would like to meet or reach for our programs. We are typically around 200 to 250 people that will be admitted. Um, but we also look at the home of a candidate. So we, there's a, we have a holistic approach to how we view candidates. So just because you don't make the GPA doesn't necessarily mean that you would not get in. Now for advanced standing, it's hard and fast, but just because you, um, you know, may not have taken one class or another class doesn't mean that you won't get into the program. We, we take a holistic view at the, at the students that apply and then admit based on that. Um, I see here, what is the demographic of a typical admitting cohort? It, it really depends on, um, it really depends. I think the last time I looked at the numbers, the last time I looked at the numbers, I do know that we are, we, we are very white women kind of heavy, but I think that exists across all programs. I think it exists across the uh, social work profession in general. Um, we, I think our next largest percentage are students who identify as Black and then those who identify as Hispanic. But, and I know those numbers are very close. So there might be like a 2% difference in between those numbers. And then after that, um, we have, according to how, according to how um, the census notates it as Asian Pacific Island, et cetera, that's our next um, cohort or, or the next um, demographic. What percentage of applicants apply get admitted? We had right around 700 students that applied last year. Haley, question. Yeah, so I was just wondering, how would a an online student do an assistantship? Like, would that be completely virtual? And how does that type of thing work? So our assistantships are actually one of those things where it is only offered for our full-time students. 
because of proximity to the professors for right now, and also because those students are still considered part-time students, there are certain parameters around assistantships for part-time students. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was I was trying to apply last year, so I have already reference three reference later. But if I apply this year, I have to uh, do that again, or the reference letter is stay there. Yeah, for this year, you would re um submit reference letters. I would have them um just update the letter with new dates. Um, if there's any additional information for them to add, I would have them update that that letter. But the updating is not necessary if I if I'm not attending school for a year. Um, so we we also don't have your old application online. And so you would you would need to resubmit it. I need to resubmit it? Yes. Uh, okay. Hi, I see a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Give me, um, Rose, give me just one moment. I see here an international student. So at the end of probably in the same place that you found this information under Connect Sessions, we will have students come in, I think, January in order to do a connect session um, very similar to this, the panelists will be students. And so thank you so much, Haley. Um, the panelists will all be students. And so please feel free to join us there. I will also look to see what students we can tap to connect with you, if you don't mind. Um, I know that we do have some international students that are, um, that are from Africa, different countries in Africa. And so I will look to see who we can connect you with. Rose, go ahead. I blanked again. <laughs> um, it will come back to me. I just have to read back the, read back the messages. May I, I remember. Ask a question? Uh, oh, sorry, Rose. Oh, no, you're good. Okay, so for the dual program for MSWMPH, is it, I guess, better to go to, um, I guess, sessions that talk about both of them or like a dual degree session that goes about both of them or kind of like how I did with uh, the MSW, can I just go to MPH, like meetings, whatever they host in order to like learn more about it? Yes. Um, I, you can go, I, I so it's interesting because we have the combined program, um, but my recruitment efforts and their recruitment efforts don't really overlap. So if there are additional questions that you have for them, then I would reach out to them specifically or if they're having information sessions, I don't even know that information. The other thing that you can do is reach out to Dr. Rebecca Wells on the website. Um, if you look on our dual degree page, you'll see the contact information for our coordinator. Dr. Wells should be able to connect you with, the, with her counterpart there in, in okay. MPH. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Teresa and then Anna. Thank you. Um, yes, you mentioned um, 700 applicants. So is that 200 to 250 accepted per program or per location or just overall in the MSW program, whether it's Gwinnett, Athens or online? The latter, that, that is 200, 250 across all of our programs. Okay, and um, I'm interested in the uh, extended Gwinnett campus. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that there's on the website, Center Extended Time Programming mm -hmm. Sessions. Um, but I don't, I wasn't able to attend the one of the ones for the Gwinnett campus. Will those be posted online at any time? 
those are typically smaller and we haven't posted any of them. I know that there's one coming up next week, I think, where we'll talk about all three of those programs. Um, and so it will be kind of the information that I gave at the beginning, but it will be much more specific to the other, my counterparts. So um, Ms. Wooden Smith and um, Mr. Middlehammer will be there to help answer and fill in some of those questions. We focus today a lot on the funding and application process. That, that meeting next week, we'll talk extensively about the program, the program differences, um, how, how to be admitted into the programs, what support looks like in the programs. That, that we'll talk about all three of our programs next week. Okay, um, for the application, the um, personal narrative or the narrative statement, um, like, for example, the first question about um, privilege, mm -hmm. should we use like um, sources or is that just really based on our view of defining privilege? Does that make sense? Yeah, if I can remember correctly, and I haven't looked at it in a little while, but if I can remember correctly, each of those questions ask um, really specifically what they're looking for. If there are things that you want to be able to cite in your answer, then feel free. I know that it's set up for APA format, which okay. is the standard format for writing. Um, in, in the profession just in general. So whenever you read research articles and those types of things, um, it, they have the APA formatting uh, in a, uh, as a part of them. So you, you but you really can um, answer them how you, how you feel necessary to answer them. I think it goes back to the question that um, Rose asked earlier, really, what it, what you feel like you need to do to put your best foot forward, um, answer in that manner. Well, the, the question, reflect on the term privilege personally or socially, to what extent does privilege impact individuals, communities, and systems? So I was just kind of, you know, trying to figure out how to answer that first part, um, if that makes sense. But it does. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna. Hi, thank you so much for all the information. It's been really helpful. Um, I just wanted to ask, so I've been in communication with a professor who I'd be interested in doing an assistantship with, and I wasn't sure, like, for all of the assistantships, do you, would your tuition be reduced to $25 or does it depend on the assistantship? And then in terms of like her setting things up from her end, if she um, was interested in having me work for her um, and do research under her, would like she have to go into the system and like create um, like that, uh, I guess, position to apply to or how would that work? Um, so our assistantships, just to clarify, the assistantships are actually a competitive process. So no one, no one professor could say, I want this student for my assistantship. That's not how it operates um, from, from a equity in education perspective, that's not how it, everyone has to apply and, and be selected based on, right, several people reviewing and those types of things. Now, if, if that individual has a grant and has monies for a student with a grant or through a grant, that's a little bit different. Um, but even then, a lot of times they have an application process um, that is more because it's more like you working and so you have to interview for for that type of process and so the first the assistantships again are competitive and that is what drops your tuition to $25 if you receive a, if someone has a grant position and you apply for that and receive that grant position that wouldn't impact your tuition at all thank you that's really helpful any other questions 